Oh, you can't see me over here, can you? <laughs> you want me over here. Good. Hi, I'm Steve Thompson. I'm president of Emory Thompson Machinery and third generation manufacturer of batch ice cream freezers. Emory Thompson began 107 years ago in my grandfather's garage in New Rochelle, New York. That's a suburb of New York City. And there's an old expression that necessity is the mother of invention. Well, back in 1903, ice cream, uh, you bought ice cream not at ice cream parlors, but in a department store or at a pharmacy. Uh, down in the basement of a department store, it would be where they sell uh, old-fashioned hard ice cream, pastries, candies. That's why you often see the associations of those products together. And Emory Thompson was working in a large department store like a Macy's on 14th Street in Manhattan. And he was using old machinery like this, a little bit bigger, but he was running these old-fashioned salt and ice machines. And his necessity was he was producing uh, 100,000, he was uh, making 100,000 dollars a year, which in today's money is 1.2 million. Uh, so he was working 15, 16 hours and he needed a better way to make ice cream. So he took this old-fashioned method, which I'll show you, and invented the world's first batch freezer that was mechanized. Now I know other companies, like some of the Italian companies, like to claim that they made it first, but they didn't come along until about 15 years later and they copied Emory Thompson's original patent. Now the way this old machine worked, and you probably have run one of these as a kid, is you have a wood bucket and you have an inner cylinder. There's your wood bucket and this is the freezing cylinder. And what we would do inside the freezing cylinder is what we call a dasher or a beater. And that beater spins around and scrapes the ice cream off the walls or ices or whatever it else is you're making. And it takes about 40 minutes of turning a crank. So this goes in here and then our source of cold they didn't have Freon gases back there then. Uh, the source of cold was ice and rock salt. The purpose of the rock salt is, as you know, ice melts and freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lakes freeze up in the winter, but the oceans never freeze because they have salt in them. So the salt reduces the freezing temperature of the whole mixture, and that gets the product uh, the temperature in the bucket cold enough to be able to uh, freeze ice cream. So this all gets put together, and then uh, the original ones had a crank, and for 40 minutes you'd turn the crank, which was spinning the uh, barrel around, and then you'd have a quart of ice cream, which you would scoop out and serve to people. Well, Emery Thompson took that concept and mechanized it. His first machine was a long tank filled with ice and salt water, and he, with a pump, circulated it around the barrel so it made ice cream in a fraction of the time and he could continuously refill this and make batches of ice cream. Um, and that was a vertical cylinder and the original machines were vertical and you would discharge the ice cream from the bottom when it was finished. Well, there was a flaw with vertical. Uh, some manufacturers in Italy still make vertical machines that they tout, but there's a fatal flaw and it's Newton's law, which is whatever goes up must come down. So if you put, as we're going to today, candies or nuts or fruits into the top, they are going to sink because of the gravity down to the bottom. So your ice cream is inconsistent with a vertical cylinder. You're going to have more cookies down here than you are up here. So in 1919, Emory Thompson abandoned the um, vertical batch freezer and patented the first horizontal freezer. He just took the barrel sideways. And now, when we enter the cookies into the machine, the design of the dasher spreads it all back and forth through the machine. So when we discharge it, we have a consistent product. Uh, we got away from rock salt and ice and went to ammonia. Ammonia was the way that uh, everything was frozen. Uh, air conditioning systems were first ammonia. Your walk-in freezers were ammonia. Nowadays, you can tell if you've got an ammonia leak because all your employees are dead. It's, it's a really bad product to work with. There's still some old timers around who can do it, but uh, for the most part, ammonia is, is a thing of the past. And DuPont came up with their product that they call Freon. Freon is what's in your refrigerator, it's in your car air conditioning system. And nowadays, we've dressed up the name and we call it an environmentally friendly propellant. It's still Freon. 
but today it's free on 404 is the top of the line and that's all we use and if it did happen to leak into the air it doesn't hurt the environment the way the old Freon 12s did. So that's where we are today and the batch freezer nowadays looks like this. We're going to run a couple of different sizes. We have four different sizes but this is a 12 quart finished. I rate all my machines by how much ice cream it comes out. How it comes out of the machine. Other people rate their machine, which I think is kind of unfair. Uh, they would say, this is a, we call this a 12 quart machine, 12 quarts finished. They would rate their machine by taking the dasher out of the machine, filling it up with water, and saying, okay, this holds 12 quarts. It's therefore a 12 quart machine. That's not true. It won't make 12 quarts. This is 12 quarts coming out. It's actually about a 16 quart barrel but it isn't going to make 16 quarts of ice cream. So I rate my machines by finished production, not how much they can hold in the cylinder. So this is horizontal, and this is the new style dasher. Uh, let me just backtrack and show you an old style. This is what we used for many years, and it's a great design. It's been around for about 95 years. And as it spins around inside the machine, the blades are thrown against the walls and that produces the scraping action for your ice cream. It's really nice because as the blades wear, everything on a machine wears, and as these uh, Delrin blades wear, uh, they still throw against the wall. They just throw a little bit further. So we get a much longer life out of a machine than anyone else does out of a set of a blades. And that's what we've used and that's what you'll see all over the place until we redesigned the Dasher a number of years ago because with the blades that throw against the wall, when you get into the lower speeds like gelato, if you didn't have enough centrifugal force, the blades weren't going to scrape. So we have now gone to a spring-loaded system, very blocky blades, uh, probably good for about seven to ten years before you replace them. They're spring-loaded, so again, as they wear, uh, they're still going to throw against the walls. So the maintenance on this machine will be about every five years to change the springs for about $25. The blades, you won't have to change. And so these are going to go in the machine and they're going to throw against the walls. And no matter what speed I run the machine at, whether it's 130 RPMs or 250 RPMs, it's still going to scrape uh, very evenly. So I'll put that in. You'll see there's very few parts. That's in. This front bushing goes on here. You'll notice that I use four knobs on the machine instead of the cam action that all the Italian machines have. Uh, the problem with the cam action is it wears out in five years, and then you have to replace the entire door. By using the four knobs, we get a very tight seal, and it never wears out. So let me close this up. Everything fits perfectly on an Emery Thompson, so it should go together nice and smooth. And now I want to sanitize the machine. I've had the machine. I've had my hands in the machine. I haven't used it for about a week. So theoretically, bacteria is building up in the machine. I use a product called Sterachine. Now, all sanitizers are based on chlorine. Uh, you use chlorine in your swimming pool to kill off bacteria. We use chlorine in the machine. The problem is an easy way to sanitize a machine, if you have nothing else available, is a cap, not a cup a cap full of Clorox bleach to a gallon of water. But you get a health inspector come in and they see the bleach and they get all upset uh, that you're using bleach in your machine. And in, in the good old days, I used to fight them. That was hopeless. And uh, say, well, what do you think you put in a swimming pool? Nowadays, I just acquiesce and I buy Sterachine, which is a pre-measured packet. And if you follow the directions, uh, you don't have to rinse afterwards. And it's basically a chlorine base. So I'm just going to throw a little of that in water, stir it up real quick. Now, as soon as this hits the machine, everything will be sanitized. All the bacteria will be killed. And as long as I don't open the door to the machine, I don't have to sanitize again. I can run for the next 8 to 15 to 20 hours without ever re-sanitizing as long as I work non-stop and don't uh, open the door to the machine to introduce any bacteria. So I'm going to turn it on. 
Now I have only the beaters spinning. Right now it's spinning around at 231 RPMs, which is full speed. I have the refrigeration switch off. When I turn this refrigeration switch the, on, the walls are going to get instantly cold, and that's going to be our source of cold instead of rock salt and ice. If I turn on the refrigeration right now, I'm going to create a giant ice cube. Which brings up a good point. I give all my customers my home telephone number. Um, you can call me nights and weekends up until 9 p.m. Eastern. I, I do sleep once in a while. So if you're over in India and it's 3 in the afternoon, it looks like a great time to call me. Please see what time it is in the United States before you call. Uh, but up until 9 o'clock, nights or weekends, you can call me. Why? Because our machines are so simple and so reliable. Here's where people make mistakes. They're making cherry Italian ice, and they put water in, they put the cherry juice in, but they forget the sugar. So without the sugar, something to freeze, it's as if you're just rinsing the machine. You're making one giant ice cube, and it all freezes up and makes lots of noise. So you call me, and I'll have you taste the product. You say, oh, it tastes awful. Uh, well, I know you forgot the sugar. And trust me, you'll do it. People do that. When we take the ice cream or ices out of the machine, we're going to turn off the refrigeration switch. We're going to leave it spinning to push all the product out in about 35 seconds. Right now, as you know, there's just water in here, uh, which is very loose compared to Italian ice or ice cream. So if I open this gate right now, I'm going to get a bath. It's going to go everywhere because it's so loose. So turn it off and then just drain it out. The cylinders on all our machines have a slight tilt to them when we manufacture them so that the machine will completely drain out. Now, if I followed Sterachine's uh, directions properly, I wouldn't have to do a final rinse, but I'm really not too good at taking direction, so I'm going to throw another rinse through here. Always remember to close the gate. It, it sounds a little silly, but one day you'll be pouring, oh, I see some people here you're going to meet later who are nodding their heads. When you pour the mix in, uh, and it's going all over the floor and you say, oh, I didn't tighten it wrong or there's something wrong with the gasket or curse you, Steve Thompson. Take a look and see, did you leave the gate open? I do that all the time too. Uh, quick story, just because I want to show you how simple these machines are and again, why I give my home phone number, which by the way is 914-643-7391. I just got a new car and it's got one of these push button starts. And so I pulled up to where I live and I'm talking to the gatehouse and uh, have the car off. And all of a sudden, you know, it's time to leave. Sadie, the golden, who you'll meet later, uh, is ready to go. And so I'm pushing the start button and nothing's happening. I'm like, damn, new car, you know, pushing the button, nothing happens. The guard looks in at me and says, Steve, why are you pushing the button to the radio to start your car? <laughs> so if I can do that, you can forget to leave the sugar out. So we've got that out. I'm going to put a rinse through here. Just plain tap water. Now you don't have to do this if you follow the directions. And again, I'll just turn on the beater. No refrigeration. Now, the, I call this a sterile water. I'm going to keep this because anything that comes in contact with the ice cream, my spatula, even say my hands if I'm uh, throwing some cookies in or something, they're now more sterile than they were. So I keep the sterile water handy and by keeping the spatula in it, it reminds me that uh, it's sterile water and not the water I want to use for making Italian ice. So let's drain that out and now we're ready to make uh, some mango Italian ice. Those of you who haven't made Italian ice before, first off it's got a bunch of different names. In New York it's Italian ice. In Philadelphia it's called Italian water ice. Up in Rhode Island they call it frozen lemonade. Uh, down in um, uh, Louisiana, uh, or Arkansas rather, it's called Greek ice. Uh, it's not any different, it's just that five Greek brothers left Brooklyn and went down to Arkansas and they said, why should we call it Italian when we're Greek? So it's Greek ice. Out in Hawaii, Bubby, uh, Bubby's ice cream is Bubby's uh, Hawaiian ice, a uh, great company. Um, that's all drained out and I can just set this aside. 
So the name doesn't mean anything. In fact, if I go into a fancy French restaurant, they're going to be selling sorbet. Well, sorbet, this is, people really get confused about this. Sorbet is Italian ice with a fancy French name. That's all it is. Uh, the difference between sorbet and Italian ice is about 75 cents more that you can charge for it. Maybe even a couple of dollars more, but it's the same product. It's sugar, water, and flavor. When we make Italian ice, it's going to be flavors like rainbow, uh, cherry, grape, lemon. Uh, New Yorkers, we like chocolate. Uh, these are Italian ice flavors. If I go into uh, the Four Seas Hotel, uh, Four Seasons Hotel, uh, they have a machine there and they're going to be making mango, they're going to make papaya, champagne, grapefruit, sorbet. It's the same thing, sugar, water, and flavor. People like um, my customer, Little Jimmy's, will tell you, you can't learn how to make this product. It's super secret. The recipes came from their great-great-grandfather over in Genoa, Italy. Well, I'm their great-great-grandfather and I've never been to Genoa, Italy, so I'm going to show you today just how easy this is. Let me pass out the formula, and these are up on the website. Is that right, Ken? These are on the website for you to see, and um, this is going to be the recipe for uh, a very easy mango sorbet. So if you'll pass those to the back, and I'll leave these here. Uh, we could call it mango Italian ice, and it's the exact same thing. And we're going to use let me backtrack a little bit. I'm good at that. Uh, there's three levels of Italian ice uh, or sorbet, and you're going to use all three. The very best method is fresh fruit. If you could get fresh lemons, fresh oranges, uh, fresh cantaloupe, that's a fantastic ice. But that's not always going to be possible. Like in mangoes, they're coming from France, and they're going to be very expensive. So we need a more practical way to make a mango sorbet. There's an excellent company called I Rice Company, I period R I C E Company in Philadelphia. Their president is Steve Cool, like way cool. It's uh, spelled K U H L. And Steve and the people who work with him, Rod Oranger, uh, these are terrific people. In fact, call up Rod Oranger at I Rice and they'll be able to help you out. They're making a base, and this base has got some sugar in it, some, uh, uh, some water mainly mango. And this is a great way when you can't get fresh fruit to make your mango sorbet. And that's what we're going to do today. And the third level is going to be an extract. Well, this is when I get people saying, oh no, you know, it's either fresh or a base, I'm not going any lower. Okay, how are you going to do bubble gum? You know, there's no bubble gum trees growing here in Florida. So you're going to need uh, an extract. You've used an extract before. An extract is, let's say you're uh, baking a vanilla cake and you use a vanilla extract. You don't go out and grind up your own beans and then process them with alcohol to turn it into uh, a usable vanilla. You buy an extract at the supermarket. Well, we do the same thing with flavors like bubble gum or blue ice, which is a red raspberry, um, or I mean, yeah, dark raspberry. Um, we use an extract. And you have to have these flavors on the market uh, for children. They, they like blue ice. Uh, and they like uh, some, you know, bubble gum and uh, other exotic flavors like that, which are all available in the base. There's two companies that have uh, bases. Let me grab one over here. Uh, one is Edgar A. Weber. Here's a natural raspberry uh, extract. Edgar A. Weber is in Wheeling, Illinois. And that's W-E-B-E-R, Edgar A. Weber Company. They make excellent extracts. There's also another company in New York called Virginia Dare. Virginia like the state and Dare, D-A-R-E. And those are also very good extracts. So that's how you do that part. Now here I've got my uh, sugar. I've got my flavor. Let me look at my own recipe. Um, We're going to use two quarts of the mango base. We're going to use one and a half pounds of sugar and seven quarts of water. So let me get over here and start with the water.
Now, it doesn't matter how many containers I put this into because it's all going to end up in the same machine. So you use whatever you have on hand. Are you using just plain tap water? I'm oh, sorry, you had a question, Ken? I'm using just plain tap water, which is, uh, brings up a good point. Uh, people say, do I need to filter the water? Um, it depends on who your clientele is. Here in Brooksville, Florida, which is just north of Tampa, we have the most awful water in the world. It's like liquid rock. It, it couldn't get any worse. Um, conversely, up in New York City, I think we had the best water in the world. Um, also, we had the best filtration system. Upstate New York, the first part of the filtration system is a lar large series of screens that the water goes through. That's to get rid of the dead bodies and the tires that have been thrown into the lake. Uh, but the water's great. Uh, here, the water's just terrible. And, but here's the point. Do I need to filter the water here in Tampa, Florida? Well, there aren't a lot of tourists. We're up in Brooksville, north of Tampa. There aren't a lot of tourists in Brooksville. Who I'm selling to, my clientele, is going to be people who grew up and live in Brooksville. They're used to drinking this water. They don't know this water is bad because they've lived with it all their lives. So I don't need to filter the water if that's what they're used to. It's going to taste delicious to them. If I'm in Miami, well, everybody in Miami is from New York. Uh, that's going to be your customer base. So yes, you need to filter the terrible water coming out of the tap in Miami so that it tastes more neutral like New York. So you look at who your clientele is and that will determine whether or not you have to filter the water. Otherwise, it's, it's not like a bagel. Uh, a bagel can only be made in New York because otherwise it just doesn't rise properly, it doesn't taste right, but that's not the case with Italian ice. So I've got my seven quarts of water and I need one and a half pounds of sugar. So let me get a container here. I'm just, I've got a fancy digital scale here and I just set it to zero. And I'm just going to measure out a pound and a half of sugar. So that would be 1.8. That's that. Now, um, my sugar. The big supermarkets down here in Florida are uh, Publix. Uh, up in New York, you might have Pathmark. Out in the Midwest, you might have Kroger. They all sell Domino sugar, uh, and they also sell a store brand. The only difference between the store brand and Domino is the price that you pay for it. It's all the same stuff coming out of just a few factories in the United States. So buy your sugar in the cheapest source that you can. If you're a wholesale Italian ice business, you might be buying 100-pound bags from your uh, bakery supplier, and, and that works great. But at the same time, once in a while, the supermarket will have a sale on five-pound bags. They hate to see me coming when that happens because I go in and buy 20 or 30 bags at a reduced price. They've reduced it just to get me into the store, and here I am buying up all their sugar. So just plain old sugar. Plain old sugar will dissolve very nicely in cold water. You don't need uh, any special thing to do to it. You don't need bar sugar. You don't need warm water. It's just going to dissolve just fine. Let me grab a spatula. That's you. And we just stir that up. So this formula is just sugar, water, and flavor. The iRice mix has some stabilizer in it. I'm um, looking on the label here, and um, it's got xanthan gum. Well, that's just a gum. That's, that's perfectly natural. I like that. Um, but for the most part, I don't stabilize. I don't put emulsifiers or stabilizers into Italian ice unless I'm going to wholesale it. And I want it to last for weeks in somebody else's dipping cabinet. Otherwise, I like to make the product as fresh as I can. Okay, so we'll pour this in. And we'll measure out two quarts of the flavor. Oh, on the cost, if you use an extract, your food cost. You know how McDonald's sells a quarter pound hamburger? Well, quarter pound sounds really huge. It's only four ounces. But that's a normal size 
uh, portion, four or five ounces. Um, using an extract, my cost will be a half a penny per ounce for the sugar, water, and flavor. The ingredients only cost half a penny per ounce. If I use a base, it jumps to a penny an ounce. So my four ounce portion costs four cents. If I uh, then use fresh mango or fresh lemon or whatever fresh flavors I have, I might jump all the way to one and a half cents per ounce or six cents for a portion that you're selling for $1.50 or $2. Of course, you have to add in uh, labor and overhead. That's, that's a given. But the actual food cost for making this product is incredibly low and extremely profitable. And that's why I often put people into the Italian ice business first and then graduate into ice cream later on, ice cream and gelato. Uh, because you can see, it doesn't take a lot of equipment. It takes an Emory Thompson batch freezer. And that's about it. Now, have I forgotten anything? Is that all the ingredients? I guess that's it. Very simple. And this will take about 18 minutes. So we'll turn that on. I'm turning on the uh, infinite overrun control, running it at full speed, turning on the refrigeration, and setting a timer. I'm going to set it for before when I think the product is ready. Now, this is something I don't put on my machines, is I don't put a lot of fancy gadgets on the machine. Uh, I don't put a timer on here because the machine is built to NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, and UL, Underri Underwriter Laboratories, uh, codes. So for this $6 timer to go on this machine, it would cost $250 for the timer to meet the codes and it would probably be tied in to shut the machine down when the timer goes off. Those are two things I don't want to happen. Number one, if the timer goes down and it's a Saturday afternoon and it takes the machine down, you're out of business. If I use just a $6 kitchen timer that I bought at the pharmacy and it breaks, I just throw it away and I go buy another $6 timer. The other thing is, this is portable. I should not be leaving the machine. I get a lot of phone calls from people say, oh, I went to talk to uh, my wife or my girlfriend or my boss and I came back and the machine was stopped. Well, they say they were gone for a minute. Uh, we know they were gone for about 35 minutes and the machine froze up solid and the automatic shutdowns shut the machine down to protect itself. But if you have this timer, you can walk with it. You can take it wherever you go. I can go back to my office and check my email and I've got my timer with me. So something as simple as not putting it on the machine uh, makes a lot of difference. And also, if this breaks again, it's not going to take down the machine. I just go out and buy another timer. Uh, the one thing we do put on the machine, uh, it's optional on the bigger machines, it's standard on the countertop, is our infinite overrun control. Now, if you're just making Italian ices, you don't need this. You can save $2,000 uh, because this is to vary the speed of the drive, something we do when we want to make low air content ice creams like gelato. But for standard super premium ice cream and Italian ices and sorbets, uh, we can run just at full speed or one speed and so you don't have to have that. It's a handy feature and I'd say about 90% of the machines leaving our factory have this on it because we don't know what's coming down the road two years, five years from now and how that product is going to need to be free, frozen. It doesn't need to be frozen at a slow speed or a high speed. This machine will be prepared to do it. Yes, you had a question. How did the older Emory Thompson make a variety of products such as one that makes the Italian ice and next thing without the IOC? The question is how do the older machines uh, do this without, um, without the IOC? Well, again, the IOC is only for very low air content products like Haagen Dazs or, um, or any kind of the gelatos. For regular ice cream, there's a range in this machine of 70, about 65 to 100 percent overrun. That's the amount of air in the product. And when you're getting into sugar water, air is not a factor. Yes, it's going to, this Italian ice will expand 17 percent. 
If I took that formula and put it into ice cube trays, you know how ice cubes crown over? When you freeze them, they expand 17%. That's without doing anything to it. So we're going to get some expansion in here, but not much. But for ice creams, we run it at the normal speed, just the on-off switch, and it's been doing a wonderful job for 95 years. Um, the infinite overrun just gives you more variety. We'll talk about gelato more and why I'm not a huge fan of it, but my machinery makes better gelato than any machines in the world because I can vary the product, I can vary the speed. Um, one thing, that, and no one has been able to copy this, we've had for 11 years, I unfortunately didn't patent it, uh, I was anxious to get it to the market, and once you sell something over state lines, you can't patent. So it's not patented, but nobody's figured out how to do it. Um, you can have a dimmer control on your dining room lights. When you dim down the lights, you're taking the 60 watt bulb and dimming it down to, say, 25 or 15 watts. You're taking power away from the light bulb. If you have a dimmer switch or a rheostat on a batch freezer and you dim it down, what you're doing is you're taking away the power of the three horsepower motor and bringing it down to a half horse or a quarter horse. Well, a quarter horsepower motor in an application that needs three horse isn't going to be able to grind through the product. It's not going to be able to spin. The machine will lock up. So that's why nobody else has it. With the infinite overrun control, no matter what speed I put it at, right now I'm at 231. If I take this down to a gelato of 130, uh, whereas where I am right now, uh, I've got the same amount of power from that motor. And I call it infinite because you can pick any speed in between. Ken, you had a question? Uh, if I want to uh, manufacture a product and call it all natural, would I have to uh, use filtered water or is tap water still okay? If you want to use, uh, call your Italian ice all natural, do you have to filter the water? No, because you drink it. When, when it comes through the tap, that is, is natural. That's as natural as it comes in nature, except for the fact that we are putting uh, some chlorine into it. Not chlorine. Um, what is it they put in to protect your teeth? Fluoride. Um, but no, that would be an all natural product. You don't have to filter it. In fact, the filtering process actually adds some salt. We have a water softener in our house, Paula and I, and we know darn well it's adding uh, a trace amount of salt to the water. That's how it becomes soft. There's nothing wrong with filtering the water, but there's no need to. What makes the product all natural is sugar is all natural, the water is all natural, it's the flavors that you use. I did have a lady once tell me that my Italian ice wasn't all natural because I wasn't going down to the U.S. Virgin Islands and chopping down my own cane, sugar cane stalks, which I have actually done, and uh, processing them into uh, sugar. So you, you can take the terminology to its nth degree of ridiculousness. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, sugar, water, fresh fruit is an all-natural product. And if your fruit is organic, well now you're all-natural and organic. So that's going to continue to freeze for a few more minutes, and once in a while I check it to see how it looks. Um, we also don't have a, a spigot on the machine. This one really drives me crazy, and anybody who's run a batch freezer you know, it's got to wonder why there's a spigot there because they have a, a cold water hose coming out and the hose only comes to here. So at very best, you can only rinse around here and it's cold water. That's fine for Italian ice, but when we make uh, ice cream, uh, if you use ice cream mix, dairy product, and cold water, it's like spreading butter on your floor. You need hot water to clean the machine. Uh, so we don't put we don't add another three or four hundred dollars cost, NSF and UL, uh, to the machine. We tell you to go out and buy a white hose from a, um, a boat supply house. Those are FDA approved for drinking. And you just hook it up to your sink and now you can spray down the machine. Uh, makes it a lot simpler and a lot more effective. If I had all the money in the world, uh, which I did when I built this room, I would have a pitched floor to a drain. I have several drains around here, so I could just dump this out onto the floor and it's all going down a drain. Yes? So, do you clean the inside of the machine with hot water as well? I do. Uh, do I clean the inside of the machine with hot water? Um, 
the rule of thumb with hot water, because I've been in restaurants where the water is so hot coming out of the tap you could burn yourself. If you can put your hand in it without pulling back in pain, it's perfectly fine for the Emory Thompson. The reason is our barrels, our freezing cylinders, are six times thicker than anyone else on the market. In fact, the other companies tell you if you introduce hot water to the machine, we're going to void your warranty. Because the barrels are so thin the way they make them, uh, the Freon gas will expand very quickly and it'll cause a bubble in the freezing cylinder. And the freezing cylinder will be ruined. That won't happen with an Emory Thompson. What other companies do, I don't have one to show you. Well, let's say this is a freezing cylinder. What they did is they started with a very lightweight uh, stainless steel and they stamped it. Big, huge press comes down and stamps it into a one-piece form. That's their freezing cylinder. But that, in order to be stamped, it's got to be paper thin. So they tell you in their warranty, no nuts, no cookies, no candies, no nothing in the machine. Whereas we tell you, you can put absolutely everything into the machine, including hot water. Uh, because the way I do it is we take plate stainless steel, big huge sheets of it, and we roll it on a huge machine, and then we weld on the back plate. The weld is even stronger than the metal we're joining. And then we grind it all out, polish it, high polish it, and we end up with a freezing cylinder that's one piece, six times thicker than anyone else's. That uh, in the, all the life of Emory Thompson, we have never worn through a freezing cylinder. We have never worn one out. And uh, other companies, especially soft ice cream machines, you routine, routinely replace the freezing cylinder after uh, 10 years or so. So that's coming along nice. Uh, I'm just checking it by eye. And the reason I do that is every flavor is different. I don't want an automatic timer. I've done side-by-side -side, uh, demos at trade fairs with uh, Capigiani, Stolting, Electrofreeze, and Taylor. And they have these automatic timers, which after eight minutes shut the machine off. Well, you see the salesman after the machine shuts off just kind of quietly going over and turning it back on because the product's not ready. And why isn't the product ready? Because of the sugar content of the product. The more sugar you add to uh, a product, the longer the freezing time. And you say, well, I'm not going to add a lot of sugar. Well, uh, yes, you are. There is more sugar in lemon, I mean, there's less sugar in lemon ice, sugar, water, and flavor. There's less sugar in lemon ice than there is in mango. Think about it. Lemon ice is sweet. Mango should be, I mean, lemon ice is tart. Uh, this should be sweet. There's more sugar in here. So this will take longer to freeze than a lemon ice. In ice cream, ice cream is high in fat and very low in sugar. So the freezing time for your average ice cream is about eight minutes. Now, you go adding fresh uh, blueberries or strawberries to your formula, and all of a sudden your freezing time is going to go up. It's going to be longer by a little bit, not much, because blueberries are sweet. They have natural fructose in them. So we don't put a timer on. And in a short amount of time, you'll learn that your average batch is going to take 16 to 18 minutes. And if it's a higher sugar content, it might take 19 minutes. It might take one minute longer. So I'm constantly watching it. And I'm going to get ready to serve this up to you. So let me make some room over here. That's the fun we have here as we get to taste everything. Be careful with these extracts. This is uh, the uh, Weber bubblegum extract. I once dropped one of these here at Emory Thompson, and the entire factory smelled of bubblegum for three months. Nobody wanted to come to work, let alone chew gum. So we're going to uh, be serving this in a few minutes, and I'm going to show you three different ways to serve it. We're actually making three different products here all at once. Let me just take a quick break. Write this down. This is really important. That says ice cream folks at yahoogroups.com. This is a blog that was started by Steve Rapucci, who owns Mad Maggie's Ice Cream up in uh, the Boston area, Massachusetts. And this is a blog of ice cream and Italian ice people and gelato people getting together, and we share ideas. If I send you, people often say, can I go into an ice cream parlor and ask them a million questions about your machinery? I say, no. 
because you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it if I sent people into your store. But you can go on this blog and everybody will spill their guts. Uh, the other day they were talking about how to make velvet ice cream. Well, someone told me you can't get red velvet anymore. Well, ice cream folks found a way to do it. And uh, you join this group, it's free. Uh, please, when you send in an email, say your name and where you're located. It doesn't do us any good to tell you where to buy red velvet flavoring if you're in Hong Kong. Uh, we need to know that you're in Cincinnati or Los Angeles uh, or Florida. But it's ice cream folks at yahoogroups.com and this is just a wealth of information. You'll get to know some of the characters there. I'm one of them. Uh, there's uh, a lot of different flamboyant people. We have a lot of fun. We're like a big family, so we get into family arguments once in a while. Uh, but it, it all is just, it's the best resource I can give you. Now, let me just uh, get a tub and see how we're doing. Okay. Mr. Cannoli wants to know um, when you're making Italian ice and, and uh, you freeze it solid, how do you make it scoopable again? Says the, uh, he doesn't have a dipping cabinet, only chest freezers. He wants to know how if you make the Italian ice and then throw it into a regular freezer where it's going to turn hard as a rock, how do you soften it up again? Great question. Uh, the best source of uh, preservative for Italian ice is cold. If you take it down to zero, you won't be able to scoop it with a hammer and chisel, but it's all going to hold together. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, this is ready. See how it cuts off like a knife went through it? That's how I know it's ready. Uh, I'll give it another second more because I want to answer that question. I'm going to turn off the refrigeration. I don't want it to get any colder. Um, if you are selling to a restaurant, let's just say that's your tub to a restaurant. The restaurant, you deliver to them at zero degrees or thereabouts, hard as a rock. You don't need a fancy truck. You put it in an igloo cooler and drive it over there. He puts this into the freezer, the chef does. Uh, if he's going to serve it at 7 o'clock tonight for his dinner, you take it out at about 4 in the afternoon. You ever take out ice cream and leave it on the kitchen counter uh, before dinner and it all melts around the outside? And that's when I grab a spoon and have about 20 ounces of ice cream. Just Oh, I'm just cleaning it up. Um, it melts around the outside. Take the tub, whether it's ice cream or ices, and put it in your refrigerator. Your refrigerator will warm it up, what we call tempering the product. It'll temper it up to a scooping temperature without it getting all melted around the outside. And then at the end of the night, if it's uh, ices, you can put it back in the freezer. So that's how you manage that. Now watch this. No other machine discharges this quickly. The Italians say, oh, well, by our machine, we've got all these guards and stuff so you can decorate. I don't want to decorate. I want to get this product made and get back to uh, my Barca lounger and a cold beer and enjoying the Florida sunshine. So there we go. Look how quick that comes out. That's my mango sorbet. And this is a three-gallon uh, three tub. And that's just how quick it makes it and how quick it comes out. I'm just going to get the last. Don't go crazy trying to get the last half pint out of the machine. If you were doing real production, you wouldn't be making just one tub of mango sorbet. You'd be making your lemon, and then you would make your orange afterwards because a little bit of uh, lemon that's left in there will be covered over by the three gallons of orange. And then you make, might make mango, and then you might make uh, raspberry. The raspberry will cover over the mango. They're both fruits. And then black cherry. And then you rinse your machine. See? Just an approximation. I turn that off. And that is our three-gallon tub of mango sorbet. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. That is a gorgeous product. That cost about $3 to make in food costs. And we're all going to try that in a second. But I want to show you something. I want to show you how what we just made was three different products. Um, let me find something to scoop with. Now, in Italian ice, in New York, we sell what we call squeeze cups. You couldn't find a cheaper way to sell this product. Is, oh, and if you go looking for squeeze cups, you'll never find them. 
It's called a pleated water cup, pleated like a lady's dress. And you know, the type that you see it, uh, a water fountain in a business, you pull it down and get some water uh, or in a doctor's office. That's the pleated water cup. And we eat that like that. We just squeeze it up. It's a lot of fun. Mm, that is so good. I don't know if I want to share it. Uh, that's how we do Italian ice. It's a great way to do it. Now, up in Rhode Island, they sell something called frozen lemonade. We also do it at uh, the amusement parks, Disney, SeaWorld, Universal Studios, Six Flags. They all use my machines, and they all make this product. They would actually pull it out of the machine a little bit softer, and they serve it like that in a cup. Now, they might get $3.50 for that, and they give it with a spoon. And if you've ever been to SeaWorld, it's hot here in Florida in the summer. And you're paying about $60 to get everybody, each member of the family in. And by 2 in the afternoon, the kids are tired and cranky. They want to go home. And you're feeling like, I just got here and I, I've wasted the day. You hand that to a child and say, go sit under a palm tree. It's going to take them about 10 minutes to eat that. And that cold, nice, sugary product is going to just revive them. And then the family can go on. So that's how we, and frozen lemonade doesn't have to be lemonade. It doesn't have to be lemon. It can be any flavor you want. But that's how we would serve a, a frozen lemonade. Now, we up the price dramatically. You know, double it, triple it, whatever we want. And we put it into a nice dish. Let's give them a little more. And now, nice silver spoon, not the plastic, but, you know, George Bush silver spoon. Um, we have a nice mango sorbet. All we've done is change the name and change the, uh, the way we're serving it. And that's a sorbet. That's the only difference is the container we're putting in. Still tastes, still tastes great. Same stuff. So I'm going to serve this all up to you. So if you'll come up now, we'll put it into some dishes and let you try this. I think you'll find it's uh, awfully good. These eye rice flavors are terrific. So come on up. Ken, do you want to try some of this, or are you holding out for the Snickers? Okay. Everybody thinks it's great coming to my course because they're going to get all these free products. Uh, by 2 in the afternoon, I go, let's make something else. They go, oh, no, 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 no more, please. I don't want to eat anymore. You have to be careful in this business because if you take a little taste like I did, by the end of the day, you've just eaten 25 ounces of frozen desserts, and you do that day in and day out, and you're not going to fit through the door. So be warned, don't eat your own product all the time. There you go. Your spoons. Okay, yeah, here you go, Ken. Oh, good. Oh, you want a squeeze cup? Yeah. All right. Okay. Ken, if you'll turn around. Ken is our IT man. He uh, runs all the computer stuff here at Emory Thompson, the websites. He uh, runs all the cameras and the soundboard and um, does a fantastic job. His wife is Vonda the Money Honey. And uh, you can have anything you want at Emory Thompson as long as you pay Vonda in advance for what it is you need, parts, machines, whatever. That's it. That's our mango Italian ice. Now we're going to switch over to the smaller machine and make um, a chocolate Italian ice. I'm going to throw this in the freezer so the men can have it for lunch. Rather than give raises, we give Italian ice. Could you open that for me? Thank you. The optimum temperature to store that it's scoopable. Italian ice is scoopable at 16 degrees. 16 degrees Fahrenheit. I know Sam Pong and everyone over in Bangkok, uh, you deal in Celsius, as does most of the world. America failed at Celsius. We just 
couldn't get it. We couldn't get the metric system. They tried teaching it to us, but we're not smart enough. But in Fahrenheit, uh, this would be 16 degrees. The question is, uh, if you're selling ice cream and ices, you, do you need a separate dipping cabinet? And the answer is yes. If you go into a store and they have Italian ice in the same cabinet as ice cream, I don't want to eat the Italian ice. It's got so many chemicals in it to make it scoopable at a colder temperature, 10 degrees colder, that I just don't want it. Uh, you go out and buy something small like this. Uh, he's not here today, but turnkeyparlor.com. That's Neil Williams, and that's T-U-R-N-K-E-Y-P-A-R-L-O-R. Turnkeyparlor.com is the best place to buy cabinets. This is a Nelson cabinet, and I've had this one for about 15 years, and I dedicated to Italian ices. And so I have my ices in here, and I like the floppy door for ices because the other kind of cabinet, gelato or ice cream, we call visual display cabinets. You can see the product. The problem with seeing the product is you're refrigerating all that air space. And at six degrees Fahrenheit, that's okay. It's just costing you electricity. But at Italian ice temperature, 16 degrees above zero, it gets a little dicey trying to keep the product steady with all that uh, open air. So these cabinets cost less than the floppy door cabinets, as I call it. I don't know what their real name is. They hold their temperature better. So this is an ideal uh, cabinet for, uh, for your ices. Now, uh, they're double deep, uh, this type of cabinet. So there's a tub I can see, and there's a tub down below. So I'm scooping from the tub I can see. And then um, as the day goes on, I'm going to bring up the tub from down below which has been warming up to scoopable temperature. I then go over to my zero degree Sears chest freezer and pull out another tub of mango and put it down below. So uh, from two in the afternoon till eight o'clock tonight, it's warming up to a scoopable temperature. So I have yet another tub ready to go. So you're always looking at the weather. Is it gonna be a good night tonight? Is it gonna be warm? Am I gonna sell three tubs of mango ice tonight? And you just transfer them from your colder freezer to your warmer freezer here. And these come in all different sizes. This is uh, called a two-hole dipping cabinet. It's supposed to hold two flavors. You can get more in it than that. They go two, four, six, eight, all the way up to, uh, I think, 16 or 18. We'll get this out of the way. And now we'll make a chocolate ice. Now this is our famous countertop batch freezer. We'll push this guy back for a few minutes. Excuse me. This is our smallest machine. And the smallest machine is made of all the same components as our largest machine, the world's largest production batch freezer, the 44-quart batch freezer. Makes 44 quarts or 11 gallons of ice cream or ices in the same time that this little one does it. Uh, they're using the same designs. They're using the same concepts. Uh, we don't have any lesser quality anything at Emory Thompson. I only make changes on my machines to improve them, never to cheapen them. And so this one, uh, is all ready to go. I sanitized it before we started this morning. And uh, this will make six quarts or half that tub. The big tub you just saw that this made, this will make half that amount in a little bit faster time. So uh, I can make two batches of this every 30 minutes or one tub every 30 minutes. Now, if you buy this, this is a great way to get into business because of the low price of the machine. And like all my other machines, it's going to last 45 years of running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you so choose. But at some point in time after you buy this machine, two or three day, years down the road, you will have made enough money on the Italian ice business and you will have convinced yourself that this is a fantastic way to make money, that you'll move up to a bigger machine, not because you're wearing this out, but because you've got only a certain number of hours in the day. I work usually from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. and then I do rest for a few hours. And uh, you can only get so much done in a day. If you're spending 10 hours making your ices on this, that's eight hours that you could have been uh, out digging up new 
clients, new uh, restaurants, new hotels, new places to sell Italian ice. So the one mistake that people make in business that's hard to get wrap your head around is you only have a certain number of hours, whether it's you or Donald Trump, you can only get so much done in a day, and you've got to be as efficient as you can. That's why you go to larger machinery. But this is the way to get into business. Ken, you had a question? Uh, yes, yeah, someone is thinking of buying the uh, Emory Thompson to use in a Caribbean location, and he's concerned about rust because of the salt air. Uh, how, how, uh, how are machines in, in that kind of an environment? The question is, uh, the gentleman's going to open up in the Caribbean, and he's worried about the machine rusting. Well, we have over 35,563, I think it is, machines running in the world right now in every city, every country in the world, and rust is not a factor. Everything on this machine is stainless steel, uh, which will not rust, so it's, it's never going to be a problem. The frame that we build the machine around, I'm sorry you're not here to take a tour of our factory, but we build our uh, steel frames and then we powder coat them, and powder coating is about a hundred times more superior to just painting a frame. Uh, the, the powder coating gets embedded in with the metal and it'll never rust. So that won't be a problem for you. So let me pass out the recipe for the chocolate ice and we'll go from there. This is a very popular one uh, up in New York. We love our chocolate ice. In fact, there's a place over in Jupiter north of Palm Beach that is Annie's Italian Ice and Paula and I go there on weekends to get our uh, chocolate Italian ice fix. Now there's lots of different chocolates around. There's beautiful chocolates. Uh, Guitard makes a great chocolate. Uh, Forbes is a fantastic chocolate, a hundred year old company like us. Uh, but I wanted to do it today just to show you how simple it is. Uh, I bought my ingredients at the supermarket. Sugar, water, and Hershey's syrup. Now I know some of my friends in the business are just cringing right now that he's using Hershey's syrup. But it's simple and it does a good job. So. That's the way we're going to make it right now. So let me look at my own formula. Um, again, these formulas are up on the website. And we also have a series of free DVDs that we will mail you. You send us an email and uh, with your complete address, especially international. Uh, you know you're in Ecuador, but we don't. So please, add that it's Ecuador. Um, we need the complete address, and we'll mail you our set of uh, four or five CV, uh, DVDs that'll show you everything we're doing today. It's going to be one and a half pounds of cane sugar, a little vanilla, four quarts of water, and the Hershey syrup. So let's start with the water. I need uh, four quarts, so this will work here. Let's get that going. And the sugar I have over here. Again, just tap water, tap water and plain sugar from the supermarket. Nothing special at all. There's my four quarts. Yeah, four quarts, and how much sugar? We want one and a half pounds. Can you see this on camera, Ken? Over here? All right. This is a shameless trick that a chef showed me once, and I just love doing it because it, it's silly, but that's me. Uh, the guy's measuring out, actually it was about seven pounds of sugar, lots of, lots of sugar. And then he looks at his sugar, and he, he feels the bag like this. This is an executive chef. This is their attitude. And he's going like this, and he's looking at the bag, and he's looking at what he's already measured out. He goes in it like that and goes, like that. And they go, 
perfect. <laughs> he didn't know that there was just that much missing, but it looks good. It's very entertaining. Just throw that in there. And let's see, we need a spatula. Question is, all the, are all the countertop machines air cool? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And uh, depending on what country you're in, is uh, rather than do like the Italians and take what they feel like building and then modify it to uh, the country you're in, uh, we take an order and from the ground up we build it to match that machine. If we're going into Haiti, we're going to build it with that voltage. Uh, we just shipped two machines to the Papier. Papiete New Guinea, I'm pronouncing that wrong, and um, they were, um, that was, it was actually a San Francisco company, but they, we found out they ultimately went to New Guinea, and they were um, 440 volt, so we buy special compressors just to match that voltage. So I've got my sugar and water. This is when I find out if I left the gate open. And I didn't. Now ice cream, we're going to make ice cream uh, after the, a little bit after the break. And ice cream, you won't know exactly how it tastes until it's uh, been frozen for 24 hours. The flavor blooms. But with Italian ice, we know what we've got right when it goes in. So I can taste this product before I freeze it and know that it's going to be good. So I'm going to pour this in here. I'm going to turn it on to mix it. I only heard part of the question. They want to use a little home machine. It is, uh, they want to use a little home machine, a little hand crank, and uh, work on their formulas. It will and it won't work. Um, a lot of recipes for ice cream uh, that are in cookbooks um, are designed for the homemaker, and if you're making ice cream, the first thing it says is break two eggs. Well, you break two eggs and then translate it up to these size machines, two eggs becomes 48 eggs. I mean, they, they just don't translate up properly. Uh, the texture is definitely not going to uh, uh, work because the longer the freezing time, and now we're not talking a minute here or a minute there, we're talking uh, salt and ice machine is going to be 45 minutes as opposed to 8 to 10 minutes. Um, that's going to change the texture completely. I will show you a little later a book by Malcolm Stogo called Incredible Ice Cream and it's got over 300 recipes in it. And I tell the story that except for a barbecue grill, I'm not a very good chef at all. And uh, if I want to make, say, pancakes, I don't know how to make pancakes, but I would go out and buy the joy of cooking, or Paula would have it in the kitchen, and I would look up how to make a blueberry pancake. And I'd follow the recipe, and you know what? It's going to be a darn good pancake. And then over time, if I'm constantly making pancakes, I'm going to adjust the joy of cooking's recipe uh, to my personal taste. But my initial selling, or giving pancakes to the family are going to be great. People are going to rave about them because it's a time-tested recipe. What I would do is buy the book from us, and I'm not here trying to sell books, but this is the best book I've ever found, and you buy the book from us, you follow the recipe, you will have great ice cream. And then you will modify what uh, this book has put together to your own personal taste. Uh, a good example of the story is that uh, Ben and Jerry's, who we put in business, we also put haagen in into business, but uh, Jerry uh, is known to have a sweet tooth, and the rumor is that he burned out his taste buds in college doing all sorts of illegal drugs and uh, can't taste sweet the way you and I do. So Ben and Jerry's ice cream is sweeter than haagen and that's why. But, so you will adapt the product to your own personal taste. I'm going to taste this right now and just see uh, where I'm at on the chocolate because I'm not really measuring. Oops. 
That's good. Oh, yeah. You're going to love this. I'm going to put a little more in. Yeah, you can never have too much chocolate. Okay. That should do it. Now I'm running that at full speed because again, it's an Italian ice. And I'll set a timer for an approximation and we'll, we'll check it. So your Italian ice is basically just sugar and water and flavor and nothing secret about it. If there's anything secret about it, quite frankly, you give me anybody else's machine and I'll make a great ice cream. But you try to make Italian ices on someone else's machine and your machine isn't going to last very long because the product when it comes out is the consistency of wet cement. It's a very heavy, heavy, it's the heaviest frozen dessert you can make. Uh, and other machines, their beater or dasher as we call it, isn't strong enough to hold up to the demand of making this product. Over 90% of all Italian ice in the world is made on Emery Thompson batch freezers because it's so rugged and so durable and it's going to do it year in and year out for you. Now this is a great product to uh, wholesale. Um, we were, I was talking the other day with some customers and they said, well, uh, where we are, uh, San Diego, it doesn't really get cold in the winter, but uh, ice cream sales drop off. Will the Italian ice sales drop off? Well, they could. It, it really depends on the amount of tourists, but New York is a good example. In New York, um, our Italian ice season is from May 1st until just after Labor Day. After that, uh, you know, the day after Labor Day, people think it's winter and they have to go up into the attic and get their winter uh, sweaters out. Um, but if you had a situation like that, that's when you want to start cultivating, uh, selling uh, Italian ice or sorbet to restaurants. Um, a restaurant uh, doesn't necessarily want to buy this machine from me, though many of them do. Uh, but they don't have, they don't feel they have the room in the kitchen and they don't want to hire another pastry chef just to make uh, frozen desserts, which the union uh, in the, the kitchen might require them to do. So uh, what you do is chefs are very busy all the time. Even when they're not busy, they make themselves look busy. So what you do is you make up uh, two or three flavors of Italian ice called sorbet, maybe a pear, maybe a grapefruit, uh, maybe a Bordeaux wine sorbet, and uh, you put them up in the containers and you just walk in at 9.30 in the morning. That's when the executive chef is doing all their purchasing. And uh, because if you get there at noon or before dinner, they're just way too busy to see you. Make sure you see the executive chef. Don't, don't give it to uh, a dishwasher because he's going to take it home and eat it and the chef will never see it. But just walk in with, uh, you know, three tubs of different flavors, your list of flavors that you make, and you say, here, chef, these are for you. Uh, we can deliver every third day and we have a minimum order of only three tubs. And then you leave. And then you come back a couple of days later with maybe a couple of more tubs, two more flavors, and you say, okay, chef, now let's, let's talk about what you'd like. What kind of order can we sign up? And oh, and by the way, chef, if you have any ideas on how to improve my chocolate sorbet, please let me know and I'll tell our sorbet maker to adjust the formula just for you. Uh, that chef has never made sorbet in his life, but he's an executive chef, so he's gonna love to tell you what to do. So you're taking dictation from him, your, uh, your minimum order is wonderful. haagen might have a minimum order of uh, 10 three-gallon tubs, and the chef's thinking, where am I gonna put this in the restaurant? I have no room. And you deliver, and they deliver once every two weeks. Well, you deliver every third day. Uh, the way a chef changes his recipe is by, uh, changes his menu rather, is by changing up uh, what he has on the menu. That's how they improve the restaurant. So one night maybe he's featuring chocolate sorbet, the next night he's featuring a mango sorbet. Well, if he's bought from haagen and he's got six tubs of chocolate sorbet, he's stuck selling chocolate sorbet for the next two weeks. With you walking in, you can give him a greater variety in smaller quantities so that he can have whatever he wants. And one thing about executive chefs, they're very, um, they're very loyal. 
the average executive chef stays about five years at a business and then moves on to another restaurant. That's how they feel that they grow. And um, they take everyone with them. Chefs are great. They really are terrific at, at dealing with food and other products. But they know what also makes them great is having great suppliers. They know where to buy the best fish. They know where to get the freshest vegetables. Now they know where they can buy the best sorbets from you. So every time they move, they're going to take you with them, and they're going to tell all their friends. But not like we do. We go to a cocktail party. Ken and I are at a cocktail party, and Vonda and Paula, and we say, hey, look, I just got this new Apple phone. Isn't this really great? Look at this app. Look what it can do. An executive chef goes to a cocktail party and says, I have a new source for mango sorbet, and you don't. You know, but the other chefs will find out where it is you're buying the mango sorbet. Any questions I can answer so far? Yes, Ken. The gentleman in, in uh, the Caribbean says they have 110 volt power, but it's not always reliable. It often cuts in and out, and he wonders, uh, does he have to worry about damage to the machine, or does he have any need for special equipment? Uh, the gentleman in the Caribbean has 115, 110 volt power, and, and it is not reliable. Well, that's true around a lot of places around the world, but these machines run on 220. And any place that you have 110, which is plug-in for light bulbs, you also have 220. If you have central air conditioning, or if you've got an electric oven, or even an electric clothes dryer, you've got enough power to run one of these machines. 115, as they call it, or 110, is not enough power to run something this big. Uh, but the machine is designed to protect itself. If there's a low voltage, it's going to drop out and uh, shut itself off. That's, that's pretty common. Can, uh, can you operate any of our machines from a home kitchen? Can you what? Can you operate any of our machines from a home kitchen? From a home, a person wants to know, can you operate from a home kitchen? Again, it's the power supply. Yes, you can put this in a kitchen, uh, but you need the 220 power line which is, again, it's in your house. Uh, it may be out in the garage, and you'd have to run, have an electrician run a line for it, but uh, it's certainly doable. It's not like what we call three-phase power, which will only run on three-phase. Uh, this is going to be available to run anywhere. What about the low lead or lead free type of offer? Is that applicable to you? The what? Low lead or lead free type of Uh, the question is about lead. Yes, it is applicable. Um, back prior to 1996, um, every machine in the world that uh, had to do with dairy, whether it was the piping uh, that the milk went through, or the machines that made the cheese, uh, or the machines that made the ice cream, they all used a standard of the industry called dairy metal. It's a stainless material. It's what the door is made out of. It's what the dasher was made out of. And these materials are, were great to work with, and they were fine, uh, but they do contain 5% lead and copper. And the federal government in 1996 changed the laws. They said, you can no longer have but a trace amount of lead and copper in your product. Back then, it was 600 parts per million, which is about three or four grains of sand in the whole machine. We switched out of dairy metal in 1996 and went to uh, castings of stainless steel, pure stainless steel. Very difficult to machine, uh, absolutely can never be worn out. When we did that, we switched from the black and silver label uh, over to the blue and silver so we can spot a dairy metal machine. Since then, and people say don't get me started, but in uh, 2009, February 11th of 2009, uh, President Obama signed legislation to toughen up the dairy law to make it uh, 300 parts per million, even less. And they started sending people out to shut down whole dairies. Uh, in August of 2011, the law was further toughened to make it uh, 200 parts per million, which is about one grain of sand, or in, in other words, non-existent. So the law has gotten tougher. Uh, someone's going to call up and say, I've got uh, dairy metal machines and I've been running them for 40 years and no one's ever given me trouble. Well, you better start saving for a new machine because when they come in one day from the health department, they are going to shut it down. 
if you buy a used machine on eBay, let's say, or Craigslist, and it's got dairy metal in it, if it's the black and silver label, and you take that home, uh, as soon as they come in to give you, they're going to give you a permit for the whole space. This particular space we're in right now is, uh, FDA is approved by the state of Florida for wholesale manufacturing. And so they had to approve the floor and the walls, the lighting and everything else. When they give the whole approval, they're going to see the dairy metal machine and they're going to red tag it and say, you can never run this. So now you've spent $9,000 on a used machine that you cannot run. And they will find you. Uh, they're shutting down whole multi-million dollar dairies around the country uh, for having dairy metal. They say, we've given you enough time. It's been since 1996. We've warned you we're coming. And, and now they're coming. So uh, it's a bad idea to buy a used machine of any brand uh, if it's still got the dairy metal in it or if it had it after 1996. Or, you know, it's, it's buyer beware. The other way to look at used machinery, though, is here we have in this room, we've got the tables, we've got the floor, we've got the freezers, we've got the Hershey syrup and the sugar. All these are important parts of the business. We also have out in the ice cream uh, parlor, if we had one, a beautiful decor. And we've spent money on advertising. And we have beautiful lighting. And we uh, do all these promotions. All that is for zero if you don't have a working batch freezer. If you buy somebody's used batch freezer and it is already old and worn or mistreated because it was in a franchise where they were never taught how to do it properly and this machine goes down, you're out of business. Everything, the other $100,000 that you spent money on is for zero uh, if that machine doesn't work. So my way of thinking, of course I'm here to tell you about new machines, but why would you buy anything but a new machine that's 100% reliable and has never been owned by anybody else when it's the absolute heart and soul of your business? It, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, for many years, I was a salesman for my company driving around uh, New York and Long Island and Westchester. Now, I didn't need a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow to get around. It wasn't important. But I did need a good Chevy Nova to get me from point A to point B because without a good car, I couldn't sell machines. So the heart and soul of my job was actually my car. Uh, that's changed now. We have the internet, and we have uh, Facebook, and we have YouTube. Uh, but you've got to look at the equipment in the store and say, how critical is it? Look at this stainless steel table. How critical is that to your business? Not very. I mean, we could find something else. We could take a couple of milk cartons and put down a piece of plastic over it, and it'll do the same job as this. So I didn't have to buy a new stainless steel table. There are other ways around it. But if that machine goes down and you can't make ice cream, where are you going to get ice cream? Are you going to tell your customers, I'm sorry, we're not making our high quality level. We're currently buying Hershey's until we can save up to buy a machine. How long do you think you'll have customers for? So it's just good common sense. I'm going to take a look at this now. That looks nice. I'll give it just a, a hair longer and we'll try that chocolate Italian ice. If you've never had it before, you're really going to love it. It's, a, it's an addictive flavor. So I'll make some room over here. After this, we're going to take a brief uh, Starbucks coffee break. I'm running low and we'll be back here in about 10 minutes and then I'm going to uh, introduce you to Jeff Marco who took my course here um, a while back and now has a, a really incredible business that you're going to get a kick out of hearing about. So I'm turning off the refrigeration, open the gate, and there comes my chocolate ice. Look at that. That's pretty beautiful. Whoop. <laughs> There's a lot of it. So see, you can run a machine on, uh, run a business on this size machine. And that's about it. Now, here's one case where I've made chocolate. There's really nothing else I can make except maybe chocolate chip. 
uh, because I've got maybe a half a pint or less than a half a pint. It's, it's four ounces that are left in the machine. And um, so now I, would, I will rinse the machine before I go on to something else. But I wouldn't have made just chocolate and then go to lemon. I would have, like I said before, done lemon and then gone on to um, the different flavors. So that's, that's our chocolate Italian ice. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Oh, man, I could just sit down and eat this all day. But I'm a diabetic. I mean, you'll, you just, that'll be the end of me. So let's uh, come on up, and I'll give you all a taste of this. If anyone wants to be brave and try a squeeze cup, we can do that. Again, this is, this is what I call real simple chocolate Italian ice because I didn't use anything exotic. I just used plain old Hershey syrup. Isn't that good? Uh, yeah, the squeeze cup. All right, a brave person. Absolutely. There you go. Squeeze cup. Paul is not listening, so I can tell this story. I was doing a trade show once, and there was this lady who came by, and I wanted to talk to her. So I was telling her about Italian ice, and then it comes time to give her some Italian ice, and I hand her a squeeze cup, and she had said that she was from uh, Sandy, uh, oh, what's that, Malibu Beach uh, in California. So I hand her a squeeze cup, and I go to hand her a spoon, because she's from California, and she says, what's that for? I said, so you can eat the ice. She goes, I'm from Brooklyn, and proceeded to eat the ice with a squeeze cup. She knew what she was doing. There you go. Thank you. And everybody can have seconds and thirds and fourths. Do you like the squeeze cup or the? Squeeze cup. Okay. Just a little. All right. There you go. How is that? Ken, you want to try that? Okay. How will the consistency change once it's been frozen? Um, how will the consistency change once it's been frozen? It won't. Um, depending on how you It'll treat it. Scoop just like this. It'll scoop just like this. In I fact, I would, in a, in a retail situation, I would probably put this in the freezer for an hour, and uh, that's nice and stiff right out of the machine, but I would even take it a little bit stiffer uh, so it doesn't melt too fast with the customer in the, in the squeeze cup. But that's, can you see that on the camera, Ken? Yes. That is a beautiful product. And there's variations on this. You can throw some chocolate chips in. Uh, that makes it good. Um, maybe a little Tia Maria liqueur would be nice in it. There's all sorts of fun things you can do with it. Uh, this is, as you're going to see later, uh, our batch freezers are the only ones I'm aware of that you can put alcohol into. Normally, you have to add the alcohol later because alcohol never freezes. Uh, it stays in suspension in the product. Uh, so it tends to make your product very watery. But uh, our machines freeze so stiff that we can get the product nice and stiff and uh, still add alcohol right into the machine, which is a lot of fun. And you're going to hear all about that uh, coming up next. So I'm going to pop down my uh, um, microphone. We're going to take a 10-minute break to uh, get some coffee and get set up. And then I'm going to introduce you to Jeff. <laughs>